Welcome to another episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show with another fascinating guest uh, helping to create uh, a better tomorrow on many different fronts and working at really fascinating uh, intersection of people, technology, national security, strategy, education. Uh, we're going to be talking about a range of themes, everything from artificial intelligence to, to fashion and wellness. We are today to be joined by Dr. Lydia Kostopoulos, who is a science and engineering technology advisor at the United States Joint Special Operations University, and who previously served as innovation advisor for the U.S. SOCOM uh, J5 Donovan Group, where she analyzed strategic trends relevant uh, to the special operations in the context of emerging technologies. And uh, for our ex-U.S. listeners and viewers, SOCOM uh, is the uh, Unified Combatant Command that's charged with overseeing the various special operations components of uh, Army, Marines, Navy, and Air Force, uh, and is involved in a variety of activities from counterterrorism, unconventional warfare, counter-narcotics operations, uh, and the Joint Special Operations University uh, is the designated agency within SOCOM, uh, which conducts uh, special operations force education. Uh, Dr. Kostopoulos' work lies at the intersection of national security, strategy, and technology. Uh, she forecasts emerging threats around disruptive technologies, persistent debates uh, in the NATO uh, Science for Peace program, is on the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers USA AI Policy Committee, and has been awarded the U.S. Presidential Service Award for her service to the cybersecurity community. Uh, separate from all her work at SOCOM, she is uh, very passionate about social tech awareness. Uh, she has an art series uh, called Art About Art of AI. Um, she released an open source game uh, called Sapien 2.0, uh, talking about uh, technologies and the effect on humanity. Uh, she's also the founder of her own fashion label called Empowering Workwear by Lydia, which has an agenda uh, to promote awareness for change around women's issues and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, she's also into wellness, uh, currently exploring a fascinating uh, in the area of epistemic wellness and human performance. Uh, she has a PhD in political science and security studies from University of Siena in Italy, her master's uh, in security and international conflict uh, at uh, from Innsbruck and a bachelor's in international relations from the University of Sarja in the United Arab Emirates. Speaks multiple languages, uh, English, Spanish, Russian, Italian, and Greek. Uh, a lot to talk about. Uh, Dr. Lydia Kostopoulos, thanks for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's, uh, it's great having you. Um, I, I want to start things off like I typically do by uh, handing you the floor for a couple of minutes just to talk about yourself. You have a, a really fascinating background, obviously, uh, it goes without saying. Um, take us, if you would, on a little journey back uh, to who you are, how you, where you grew up, how you got involved in, in all of these really fascinating and, and convergent areas. Uh, I think that'd be a great way to start things off. Sure. Um, I think a lot of the things that I ended up uh, doing right now ended up being by accident. And it's one of those things where life happens to you and you say, well, this is interesting and I really want to pursue it. And so when it comes to uh, national security, um, I grew up in South Texas uh, and my junior year in high school, my parents said, look, we've got this great job in uh, the United Arab Emirates at an American university there and you're coming and your options are to graduate as a junior um, or graduate as a senior in the Middle East. And I said, well, um, I'm gonna graduate as a junior and then start college over there fresh. And so I went there and my second week of class 9-11 happened. And that to me was um, a pivotal moment to, to join national security. And uh, needless to say, all of my class assignments were about counterterrorism. And uh, the same thing in my master's, I, I thought, you know, I should look at international conflict resolution. And then uh, after that, I really thought that security policy was the uh, right way to go about it. And um, that's what I focused on in my uh, PhD. So that's kind of how I got into national security, how I got into the emerging tech spaces, because uh, as I was doing analysis on uh, terrorist groups and um, guerrilla groups, I noticed that they were using cyberspace to disseminate their ideology and uh, connect and organize themselves. And I thought this is interesting. And before you know it, it's just one technology after another. 
And obviously now we are in a very colorful landscape where we have virtual reality, augmented reality, we've got AI, quantum, nanotechnologies. It's, it's a, a growing field of emerging tech across um, the space of conflict. So that's how I got into that. Um, in terms of the fashion label, that started uh, a decade after finishing uh, college in the Middle East, I returned um, to work there. And uh, I was told by my boss, who's a, a former Royal Air Force Colonel from the UK, and he said, you know, welcome here, et cetera. And he said, I want you to know that, um, you know, you should dress more conservative here. This is how um, the environment is. And I said, of course, no problem. And he said uh, that it's best to wear pantsuits or um, dresses and skirts that cover the knee. And I said, sure, no problem. And that's kind of where it all began because uh, in the Middle East, it's very customary to have suits made to you, to your body. You go to tailors, there's so many tailors there and you get things made. And it just kind of started when I realized that uh, it was very hard to find like fitting pantsuits or dresses and skirts that didn't cover the knee, but that had a, a companion um, blazer jacket. Uh, and so one thing led to another, I started designing a lot of suits and everyone was like, oh, you know, you really should start a fashion label. And I said, oh no, that's not for me. I just, I, I like, you know, putting in my pockets in my suit. I have a good relationship with my tailor, but you know, like it's been interesting, but I don't need to do that. And um, then after a lot of people insisting, I thought, okay, well, let me think about what I would do if I had to do a fashion label. And for me, it was really about the stories that I wanted to tell. And um, also the fact that we should return back to the centuries old tradition of making clothes that is fit to your size. Mm -hmm. And um, when we go and buy clothes, you might, you might say, well, I, that's what I do. I go and I buy clothes that fit me. And it's like, well, you find clothes that are an approximation to your size. And it's also um, a sustainability issue because when you make clothing that is your size, that you had a say in, that fits your shoulders, your waist, your arms, everything, um, you take care of it much better and you, you will keep it longer. And that is actually great to keep more clothes um, out of landfills. And also, um, if and when they're made right, leaving uh, extra material, if you gain weight, you can go and open it up a bit, or if you lose, you can go and take it in as well. And so this allows for you to keep that wardrobe that you've built over time and you know, you matches everything else. So it's, it's great for sustainability. Um, and then, so I started the label, but I didn't have a place to, um, to do the manufacturing. And so that was a whole other journey that led me to Scotland. And, um, but then, and which is where I had originally registered the company because I had a friend who had a manufacturing company, but with COVID and Brexit, her uh, company um, didn't have the capacity anymore. And so now I am reinventing how I'm going to do it and um, get my first product to market, which is a shirt that is called the Fortune 500 shirt. Mm -hmm. And it is a white organic uh, cotton that is woven in Northern Italy uh, in Cuomo. And it is woven by one of the, the leading world uh, mills for shirting, and they're called Canclini. And the fabric has been woven with patterns in it. And the two patterns that are in it are the male and female symbol. All, it's all white. It's a monochromatic design. Um, but if you look closely, you'll be able to see it. And the ratio of men to women in that fabric is the same ratio of men to women in the Fortune 500 CEO list. So out of 500 CEOs, there are 37 women that's the 2020 uh, number. Mm. And uh, then the shirt also comes with buttons and they are mother of pearl. And uh, the mother of pearl, like shell buttons, um, it's actually an, a great eco-friendly way to have buttons that are not plastic. It comes from the shells uh, that house the pearls. And so all of that can get thrown away if people don't take that and put it into inlays of let's say furniture or jewelry. Um, so this has come from the inside of shells and um, it's a very bright white mother of pearl uh, button. The button's called the pay gap button and the circle represents the white man's dollar. And inside the circle, there's an etched circle and it represents the 81 cents that the median woman makes. And this is from the paygap.com statistic. And then the cufflinks that come with the shirt are uh, an artistic rendition of the breaking of the glass ceiling. Mm. And 
So you've got this whole story, all these pieces together, and uh, they're numbered. There's a hundred of them. So there's all of the uh, cufflinks are numbered. And so it's one person described it as an art installation that you wear. So, and it helps have that story go forward and, and for people to talk more about that so we can reduce that. So um, now I will be uh, soon making it available for pre-order, but it will be a box where you get the fabric, you get the buttons and you get the cufflinks and you go to your local tailor and help your local economy and have that experience um, where you create something that's your own. I will be providing the patterns that, of the shirt that I've designed, mm -hmm. but you can very well go and use whatever you want. And particularly for men, I mean, the, the pattern I designed is not for men, it's for women. So they would go and, and have you know, a more traditional shirt made um, for men. So that'll be made available um, to pre-order uh, in the June, July timeframe, and it will be shipping in August. So finally getting there. Um, and then uh, another thing, so that was a, a women related story, but then um, the first jewelry piece is a national security related story. Okay. And it is um, the earrings that I'm working on are called the hypersonic deterrence earrings. And so the earrings, the way that they look, they're like a, a Nordic minimalist design, um, mm -hmm. if you can imagine. So I want you to imagine now, um, the earth and you're looking at it kind of a little bit further away and you have that curve of the earth, right? And um, a ballistic missile will kind of go up and then it'll come down. It's a beautiful kind of, let's say, curve that, that looks very uniform. Okay. Sort of. And um, the radar detects this uh, missile before it reaches its peak. So kind of earlier on compared to a hypersonic weapon. When I say kind of, I mean a lot. And that is the whole point to show the distinction. So let's look right under that and now imagine um, from left to right, uh, instead of the ballistic curve, that's a nice uh, curve. Let's think about the hypersonic glide vehicle curve. And it starts with a small boost, a little kind of up and down, okay. and then it curves the atmosphere very closer, closer to the earth compared to the ballistic missile. And the radar detects it almost right before it hits the target. So the, the earring, so if you've been imagining it in horizontal format, you take those two lines and then you make them vertical and that's the earring. Um, but they have rhinestones uh, at the end. It's a red rhinestone where the target is. And then there are two other rhinestones where the radar detects um, these uh, missiles in, in their flight path. And so it really drives the point home of how uh, concerning a hypersonic missile can be in terms of deterring it. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of the next project. And it just kind of happened. These are things that I think about and I really want to talk about. And so I'm expressing this them in this way. No, it's, it's, it's awesome. And I, I'm just, I, I'm sitting here visualizing all this. And it's, uh, as you said, it's a fascinating intersection of, uh, of fashion and national security. Um, there's a lot of places to go here. I, I think I'd, I, I'd like to, um, you know, I, I spent some time uh, looking at some of your uh, papers. Um, one, a, a fascinating one that you you, uh, you gave at the uh, the Mad Scientist Initiative, um, uh, the the Tradoc um, Command. It was called Wars Having an Identity Crisis. Uh, you know, we were talking about some of these uh, advanced. Uh, weapon systems that we, uh, you know, that we've talked about some of them on the show in the past in terms of artificial intelligence and uh, autonomous robots. We talked a little bit about directed energy. Um, you also talk, you know, you have an interesting report uh, decoupling human characteristics from algorithmic capabilities, where you talk about this anthropomorphization of, of artificial intelligence uh, and you know what's real, what's not, how we think about these things. Um, Obviously, you, you spend your time thinking a lot about the, the future of uh, unconventional uh, warfare and you know, what's coming um, down the pike. Uh, talk a little bit from, from a, a SOCOM perspective when we're dealing with special operators and uh, sort of a very unique area of uh, warfare. Uh, what are some of the things, I mean, what do you think about on a daily basis? Like, how do you decide what to work on on a daily basis? Uh, which of these threats are, uh, you know, when you go into the office, uh, you know, 
talk about sort of what how you set the priorities for what you're looking at and and what you're reporting on in in, in any given day because i I'm, I'm fascinated the way your mind <laughs> thinks about these issues talk a little about this if you would Lydia. Sure. Um, and before I do, I would just like to say that, you know, whatever I say is my opinion. It's sure. not you know, anybody's stance. It's just sure. mine. Um, so for me personally, um, when we talk about special operations, we're really trying to understand um, the utility of SOF. Uh, what does that mean for the joint force? What does that mean in the current state of, of conflict in the world? Mm-hmm. Um, we are we're witnessing conflict that um, tends to happen below the threshold of warfare. And um, amongst smaller nations, we can see sometimes um, warfare like skirmishes. So for example, between Armenia and um, Azerbaijan in the Nagorno-Karabakh situation that happened last fall. Um, But bigger nations are not going to war or doing warlike skirmishes in that sense. Instead, everything is below the threshold of warfare. And this reflects actually the technological revolution that we're in right now. So if you think about World War II, the technologies that that gave an advantage were were the newest technologies of that time. And so uh, you had mechanized infantry and um, the aircraft carriers um, made um, a big bang in, in, in that kind of type of warfare. But today, if we look at the industrial revolution that we're living in right now, which is the fourth industrial revolution, um, we've got artificial intelligence, we've got networked devices, you know, cyberspace. So think cyber warfare, for example. Um, And then we have quantum, that's an evolving technology. We've got robotics. So all of these things, and and with robotics, you can think of um, unmanned vehicles, whether it's in the air or in the sea. And all of these things change the paradigm in terms of who gets access mm. to, to a so-called battlefield or area of conflict. And um, that access is being democratized. So if I have the cyber capabilities to cause harm and I, I can do so and have the will to do so, I can inflict harm on an, another nation's banking industry or water infrastructure. Here in Florida, we saw uh, a few months ago, someone tried to attack um, the, the water critical infrastructure of a part of Florida. And it was just luck that the people inside the plant were able to stop that cyber attack. These types of attacks in terms of cyber having an impact on humans, um, they're becoming more real. And it's something that it's not exclusive to nation states to be able to do. The same thing when we look at disinformation and we look at algorithms, how they perpetuate ideas on um, different social media forums and how they can exacerbate grievances and create conflict, internal conflict and distrust. And this is actually a big issue for democracies right now because uh, and what, it's it's not just the U.S. It's it's also other democracies around the world, not just in our NATO allies area. So I think we need to think about that because it's not just a country that can do that. It's also interest groups that can do that, and then that creates a new way of looking at terrorists or politically hostile groups. Mm-hmm. You no longer need to have um, a a bomb, a suicide vest, in this kind of traditional sense that we are used to thinking about terrorist groups since after 9/11. So I think that there's a lot of really different ways that the unconventional landscape is changing. And so you you know, how do I prioritize? Well, there's obviously only so much time in the day. And um, what I try to do is try to provide as useful information as possible um, that can be actionable. Uh, When I was at the the J52 over at SOCOM, I was looking at emerging technology threats in the next decade, um, how our adversaries could be using emerging technologies. And the and I provided recommendations based on that, but based on what that means for special operations. And then now at the uh, Joint Special Operations University, I am helping with uh, education around technology. Mm-hmm. And so university, for those who are not familiar, the, it provides education and not training. So. Um, we're looking specifically at the mind aspect, not how do you use this device? It's more like, why would this, uh, for example, why would artificial intelligence be useful? How is it useful to solve? And also understanding the ethical implications. Ethics is part of 
um, everything that we do. That's so important. Sure. And trying to grapple with and understand what, how are these technologies useful? What do they do for me? And what do I need to consider um, and to use them in accordance with our values? That's kind of what I'm working on right now. And I think just like in every other industry, AI is the hot topic everywhere. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a very hot topic. And, um, you know, uh, what w related to it, um, and, and, and this is a, another fascinating piece that I, I, I saw you write about, um, and I haven't seen too much on this, but it, I, if, I'm going to go first with national security and then we'll go into health and wellness and everything else. But um, you've written about, um, when you talk about cybersecurity, we think about it a lot with technology, less with sort of the connection to biology. But, but I have spent some time uh, sort of uh, with some DARPA folks, you know, working on brain computer interfaces and, and all that neat stuff that's coming. Uh, you've written about sort of this uh, convergence, this concept of neuro weapons potentially, and how we protect uh, what gets in here. Um, we'll get into sort of biohacking and, and all that stuff in a little bit. Uh, but it, can you introduce us to sort of the theme of a neuro weapon, um, whether that's bio or you write about some ultra high frequency uh, electromagnetic pulse, things of this nature, and then ultimately sort of some of what you think about and how this connects to uh, more futuristic stuff in terms of uh, mind uploading and all, all the other wacky, <laughs> uh, you know, things that are going to be happening to our minds in the coming decades. Let's put it that way. Sure. So I'm going to have to uh, disappoint you because I don't know too much about neuroweapons. Okay. Uh, uh, my kind of work or research in that space is really around posturing and situational awareness. Okay. Understand human performance degradation and how you can improve it to have resilience through degradation. Okay. But I do not, um, and I focus, uh, I've been uh, the, for the past year doing a, an observational self study. Um, and I'm looking at women in particular mm -hmm. uh, because our bodies are different from men, our hormones are different from men. And so I've been looking at that. But in regards to uh, special operations, I wrote a piece for the Mad Scientist um, Initiative actually a few years ago. It was a letter from the front line and the request or the call was write a letter from the front line and it has to be in the year 2050. What is it going to look like? Mm. And I picked a, um, a soft scenario and um, it was, in my mind, a uh, tier one special operations unit that was going behind uh, enemy lines. And by this point, they already had a brain net where they could communicate to each other through each other's brains. They wouldn't need to talk or use a device. They could just communicate with each other's brains. And it's really interesting because you can see what Neuralink is trying to do, Elon Musk's company. Sure. Also see um, at the University of Washington, they had a successful... Uh, tests where they had three people communicate to each other to coordinate how to move a piece in a Tetris game. And it was only through the brain. So they had their own kind of brain net. And so this technology is moving forward. I don't know if it's going to be uh, mission ready in, in 2050, but you can see progress being made in that space. Yep. And then another piece in that story was around a chemical weapon that was dispersed in the air um, mm -hmm. so as to attack um, the operators that would come in through the air and just things like this where it's like how can we take things that we already know like chemical weapons and see them used in a different way that would affect uh, soft for example um, so this goes into like the kind of the nano nanotechnology weapons maybe a cross between um, these two mm. So I, I looked at, at that. That's kind of what that, that story was about. And uh, the mission in that story was to uh, prevent this rogue nation from connecting AI to all of its military apparatus and for the AI to be kind of autonomous and, and decide to do war how it wants by itself with access to everything. Um, so that, that was kind of that story. But uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty a pretty cool theme, and I just because uh, you know I thought when I uh, when I published those episodes a while back, a lot of people are very concerned about the hacking of brain computer interfaces. I, I guess I get it, but but it, it's it's you know it's nice that folks like you are out there thinking about <laughs> these problems now. And uh, yeah, so I mean, again, I can't take uh, um, credit for thinking about these things in that like biohacking sense because. Um, you really need a team of multidisciplinary people, not just you know, thinking about the design aspect and the use cases, 
um, but also thinking about, well, what does it mean when you put a chip in someone's brain? What are the signatures that are going in there? How do you harden those signatures? Um, where are the loopholes? Is there a bio loophole as well as a technological like chip loophole? Um, that, are you going to use Bluetooth? I mean, there's a million questions. It's not a, it's not a simple conversation is, is what I mean to say. Definitely a fascinating one, but it involves, I think, a panel of experts to kind of go through the range of, of what that type of biohacking could be. Excellent. So Lydia and I, I read, you know, you are, you're passionate about health, human performance. I, I read that you, you're reading a lot about longevity, which is obviously a very hot topic that we've talked a lot about on the show uh, in recent months. Uh, you been undertaking this uh, this 12 month study looking at really a, a wide range of uh, interventions specifically focusing on the female body uh, understanding how to improve optimize performance uh, talk talk about this if you would because it's really um, you're looking at all sorts of stuff from the weather to food to the microbiome to methylation patterns uh, talk about your interest uh, in this area in general and, and, and what you're uh, you're planning to do in this space well, just as I mentioned before that technology has democratized um, the ability to engage in conflict, um, the technology we have today also democratizes each individual to be able to monitor their own data. I mean, from Fitbits to iWatches to Aura Rings um, to microbiome tests that you can do and get a whole bunch of results. There's so much you can learn about yourself. And so the motivation started uh, really years ago because I was doing so much and I continue to do a lot. And I just thought, how can I maximize my potential in terms of my cognitive ability, my physical ability, and even my creative ability? And so sleep was number one. Whoever says I'll sleep when I die or I don't need to sleep a lot, that is not true. There's enough research to show that if you um, don't get enough sleep, uh, you will get early onset of dementia. Um, it also uh, hurts your immune system and um, degrades your cognitive ability as well as your muscular ability and all that. So um, the, the book in terms of sleep that got me all started was Arianna Huffington's uh, Sleep Revolution book. Mm. Um, she shared her personal story of just being this super CEO, doing everything you know on CNN and being a mom and managing companies. And um, once she starts the book kind of saying how she was having one of those days, came to the office, you know, had her seen an interview and then came to the office and then collapsed um, onto the floor and then woke up in a pool of her own blood mm. and uh, went to the doctor. She had hit the uh, table and the doctor said, you know, you're, you're tired. That's what it is. And she's like, no, really like what's going on? You know, like she's been living like this forever, you know, emails at three in the morning and you know, all that. And the doctor was like, no, 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 uh, you have exhaustion. Your body has shut down. It needs to rest. Mm -hmm. And so that's where her journey started. And I think that that's a very accessible book for the average person because um, it just, it talks about a lot of the myths that we have in society about staying up late and, and, and sleeping a few hours and being able to do it all. And she talks also about sleeping pills, which have so many side effects that are really scary. Mm -hmm. um, and she talks about how to have a nice uh, hygiene and all that. And so I got into that. And then with COVID happening and I wasn't doing any flights, I wasn't, you know, back and forth with jet lag. I was like, this is my moment to bring on the metrics and we have the technology for it. So I personally got the aura ring mm -hmm. and um, I started tracking. So it's been now almost exactly a year that I've been tracking my sleep every day. And it has been fascinating to really see that, you know, what doctors and researchers have said is true. You know, if you eat right before you sleep, you're not going to get good sleep. And you, or if you, you know, drink alcohol right before you sleep, you're not going to sleep well. And, you know, people may say, well, you know what? I sleep great after I eat, or, um, you know, I'm out, you know, real quick after I drink alcohol before bed. That's true. The data will tell you otherwise though. And what it will tell you is that your heart rate will be very high when you go to bed because you're too busy metabolizing and processing. And it will stabilize probably like at one in the morning or something like that. But the first half of the night is your deep sleep where you are getting rest for your body. So think if you're an athlete, et cetera, you know, it restores your muscles, et cetera. And then when the first, the second half of the night is where you get the REM sleep, where it's restoring your mind. It's um, uh, collating your memories, storing them and keeping you refreshed 
for the morning. Mm -hmm. And so you've lost the deep sleep and hopefully you've got some REM sleep, but um, with alcohol, sometimes you don't even get that. So you will have slept, but your body will not have rested. And that's why when people wake up um, with hangovers and all of that and feeling very sluggish, after they've slept for maybe nine hours or 10 hours, it's because the body hasn't had a chance to restore itself. And with eating, I used to be one of those people that was like, oh, but I love eating right before bed. I sleep so great. Um, it's true, your, your heart rate goes up because you're, you're metabolizing. And so by doing that, you're compromising on your body being able to rest your body. That's the first half of the night, the deep sleep uh, part of the night. So I started eating earlier. I saw uh, a big difference and I also felt better. And uh, I've coupled that with intermittent fasting. I don't do 16 hours. I do 12. So like stop eating at 8 p.m. and eat after 8 a.m. And that's something very doable that you can do. It works well for your sleep, but you um, it also stabilizes your blood glucose. There's um, a lot of research in, in that. Um, but they normally kind of do the, the 16 hour. When you read about intermittent fasting, it's 16 hours. But I, I feel better with 12, sometimes 14, but 12 is like my happy place. And, this is, the, this is, I think, the, the biggest point. It's about knowing yourself and knowing your body and knowing how you personally can improve. Because now we have precision medicine and all of that. And right. the microbiome that you mentioned, um, I did the Viome test, which is um, you send them a stool sample and it does not hurt for any bit. There's no needles involved. Um, and you send it to them in a small vial and then they get back to you and tell you all the bacteria that's in your stomach. Right. I was a, an early adapter, like in 2017 or 18. Um, and I got this big list and I'm like, I have no idea what to do with this. And I couldn't take it anywhere because, you know, you, you could go to a doctor and be like, I don't know what to do with this either. So, but years later I did it again and they've improved so much. And their app has a million things that I haven't had a chance to even understand because you, you can't understand it all at once. This is like, for me, I've been learning for years. And, but what I will say is they have something um, that's super actionable, which is they tell you what foods are your superfoods. You know, we go online and we read, you know, soup, these are the superfoods, but it's like, are they your superfoods? And then they have foods that you can enjoy and then foods that you should minimize and foods that you should avoid altogether because it does not mesh well with what you've got in your gut, you know? And so that really is empowering. And for me personally, I found that the superfoods that they recommend are the things I always have in my fridge anyway. And that I'd love. So it's just, it's funny how you're, if you just listen to your body, you kind of gravitate towards the things that feel good. And then they also advise on like what probiotics you should take, mm -hmm. what vitamins you should take. And they even give you the amount because the idea that you should take a supplement, like for example, uh, vitamin C, it's always like a thousand grams. And it's like, well, do we all need a thousand grams? Like why should that portion or that, that kind of supplement be the same for me? with my weight and my height compared to somebody else who's a lot taller than me and a lot heavier than me, for example. And also, does it matter if I'm a man or a woman with these supplements? So we're getting into this space where we're, we're understanding these things better and that helps us be a better person. Mm -hmm. And so people tell me, oh, you know, you do all these things, you must not sleep. And it's like, oh, the only reason I can do all these things is because I sleep. And so I'm trying to improve on that by saying, great, okay, we've got to sleep. Now, how about the food? And then the other thing that I've been doing around women is um, the menstrual cycle because um, there are hormonal fluctuations throughout the cycle. And I wanted to understand how, not only what, what hormones are, how they work, I also wanted to understand how it works for me. So everybody experiences the cycle differently, but we all have the same process that's happening to us. It's a, it's a biological process. Um, estrogen goes up, it goes down. Progesterone goes up, it goes down, etc. And so it's about understanding how how you how it impacts with you. And there's some like general ways to posture. And I'm I'm working on that now. I'm writing kind of a, a putting a table together in terms of like how to posture, how to even around like meetings and stuff like that. So um, but one like simple thing um, in the luteal phase of the cycle, which is the, the part of the cycle right before the period, um, you can have oilier skin and oilier hair. Um, and that's kind of like a hormonal reaction during that time. And so like using clay masks or using shampoo for oily hair during those days is a great way to keep your hair um, not oily and your, and your face looking uh, less oily as well. 
But that that's one example. Another example is during that same luteal um, phase of the cycle, you can also have um, your body temperature goes up mm. and that can have um, an impact on your sleep. And we already talked about how, how important sleep is. So I've been trying to up my sleep game with the cycle to say, well, should I use a, a lighter pajama or should I put the AC down a little bit lower? But this is, again, all about keeping your body in a resilient mode to any kind of degradation of it's, it's a baseline. And so I've, so I've been looking into all these things and it's really exciting to see with the data from the aura ring, you can see the temperature of the body exactly. So I can see throughout the entire cycle, like, okay, here's this much and here's that much. And you could see how it impacts you. And I think there's so much you could do with that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. Uh, talk to us for a little bit about, uh, I'm going to move into a slightly slight different subject, uh, art about AI, because this is another major initiative of yours. And yes. We uh, time on it. <laughs> it actually, I was motivated to do it after I spoke at the UN. I was over in Geneva at um, the UN headquarters there. They were having a conversation around lethal autonomous weapon systems and I was asked to address them on how I thought the deployment would be, um, where humans are in the loop, on the loop, oversight, supervision, all these words are important. And uh, what I noticed is, is that there's so many angles to it and so many aspects. And it, it makes sense that we don't all understand all of it. And what I thought is that one way to raise awareness that would traverse a culture and, and languages is art. And so I started creating um, art about artificial intelligence to express different aspects of it. So for mm -hmm. example, um, I have this uh, triptych, it's three pieces and uh, it's about, it has artificial narrow intelligence, artificial general intelligence and artificial super intelligence. And in the artificial narrow intelligence piece, um, I have AlphaGo, or well, the Go pieces to, to talk about, you know, the AlphaGo um, championship against the human Go player. And then also chess pieces, which is, you know, with Kasparov back in the nineties. Mm -hmm. And then uh, outlines of an, uh, like a, a smartwatch and um, a phone and um, Amazon Alexa. And to kind of express it, this is where we are today. We are in the narrow artificial intelligence land. Mm -hmm. There's, that's it. It's something that it can do something really, really well. Right. So, because a lot of people uh, sometimes talk about killer robots and the Terminator. And so that's moving into the space of general intelligence where AI equals to um, the human brain, everything the human brain can do, one human brain. And then super intelligent, it's also called an intelligence explosion. And so in that painting, it's kind of like this comet. Um, and that's what Elon Musk uh, is concerned about because artificial super intelligence is when AI's capacity capability is equal to that of all the human race. Mm. So this is kind of the concept, um, but we have not reached general intelligence yet. It is predicted that once we do, it'll be a lot faster to reach super intelligence. And there are many ethical questions around all of that. But I think a good starting point is to say, are we talking about narrow intelligence? Or are we talking about general intelligence? And then I have other pieces that talk about adversarial AI, where you're trying to trick the algorithm. So one piece was talking about an autonomous vehicle study to see if the, the machine vision element of the autonomous vehicle would be able to see a stop sign and understand it to be a stop sign if it had graffiti on top. And in this experiment, they had um, the word love at the top on top of the word stop, and they had the word hate on the bottom of it and their algorithm wasn't able to recognize it as a stop sign. Mm. And so this, this research is good because then you can make the algorithm more robust so that it's like, okay, great. Now, when you see this, recognize this also as a stop sign. There's a, another research that was done by MIT's lab six, where they 3d printed a turtle. In my painting, it's a bedazzled turtle, but in, in the experiment, it was a 3d printed turtle that actually looked like a turtle. And it was the size of your palm, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And the and Google's image classifier wasn't able to recognize it as a turtle. Instead, it recognized it as a rifle. Mm -hmm. And so 
things like that are um, relevant when we start to think about algorithms being autonomously used in the battle space, because this is a this can be a new form of military deception, mm. where you are intentionally fooling the algorithm to behave in a way that is um, to the advantage of if you're the adversary, you're doing to, to to your advantage. These paintings offer these conversations, and they're meant to be conversations. And it's the same thing with the um, the fashion label. The pieces are meant to talk about stories, and there's just a lot of uh, civic debate that I think we need to have around all these issues. Absolutely. And, and we will, we'll put links in the, uh, in the show bio to, to all this. So people will be able to, to check out your work and, uh, and, and take a look at all this. Um, you know, Lydia, one interesting thing you know, on your, on your website um, at LK cyber um, there, there's one area where you have a, a list of um, all the other, Dr. Lydia Costato, I think the list was uh, back in 2018, um, but, you know, a lot of the women that are sort of in the national security field doing, uh, you know, fascinating work like yourself. Um, I get a lot of, you know, contacts after I do these shows, and I know I'm going to get them <laughs> for this one. Um, amazingly cool stuff you're involved in, um, and a lot of people are going to be listening, maybe the high school student that's headed to college next year or somebody in college that's trying to figure out what they want to do. They hear about you. Hey, they want to be the next Dr. Lydia Kostopoulos. Um, take a little time, if you would, just to, to talk to the younger audience. Um, they want to follow in your footsteps, suggestions, recommendations, things they should be studying, things they shouldn't be studying. Um, take, 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 uh, take a few minutes to, to talk to that audience, if you would. I would encourage them to be um, as sincere to themselves as possible. Um, I think a Michelle Obama quote is really appropriate here. Uh, she said that we shouldn't make decisions uh, out of fear, um, but instead we should make them um, out of hope and possibility. And that is how I feel like I have been making decisions. I Some of these things are crazy. Um, and I mean, you know, I was in Berlin for a year. I wanted to experience Berlin because it's such an eclectic area of art and politics and um, social justice. They've got so much going on in one city. And um, I was making the art piece, uh, I Can Complete You, when I was in Berlin. And I Can Complete You is an art piece about the human relationship with robots and uh, the potential for a robot with an algorithm to replace human companionship. Mm -hmm. And I designed a frame for it. And I looked online for somebody who could make a frame um, that I designed, you know, 3D design it and print it. And I found this person in Poland. And so I found myself on the train holding my big painting <laughs> going to Poland. And I thought, I am crazy. Um, but I think that every time I thought I was crazy was a good thing because I was pushing uh, my comfort level and my bounds and um, that encouraged me to kind of allow my ideas to flourish. And I use the word allow because a lot of people don't give themselves permission to be themselves mm. and permission to pursue the things that, that set their soul on fire as the expression goes. Mm -hmm. And so that's one. And obviously there, we can't negate that there aren't, you know, there are social justice problems and there are discrimination problems and those are things that we have to fight together. And so when they, they look at their future to think and say, well, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna make my decisions in hope and possibility. That's how I'm going to operate mm. and try to find like-minded allies. And you know, it's not, it's not go study this or go do this. It's, it's really the thing is, is that we are all learning. You know, I talked about, you know, AI and we're, we're all learning about what it's capable of, what it's not, what the risks are. Mm. Um, active learning that we need to maintain. And when kids today are gonna to be doing jobs that don't exist when they're, it's time for them, you know, it's re it really comes down to understand yourself, know yourself. You know, before we talked about knowing your body, well, knowing your body is one thing, but then knowing yourself, what you like and what you don't like. And you can't know that if you don't expose yourself to other things. If you don't expose yourself to different types of experiences um, or different types of conversations, and so, uh, for example, I spent some time in St. Petersburg in Russia. I was doing a, a language immersion program and the city is absolutely gorgeous. It's, you know, 1800s in all its glory mm -hmm. in terms of the ironwork and the woodwork and the buildings, the architecture with all of the, 
designs. And um, for me, it, being exposed to all of that, I wasn't exposed to that growing up in, in South Texas. There is no 1800s architecture. Um, it just because of, you know, the, our country was, was built in a different era. And so I, I learned that I loved that. I loved the Art Deco and the Art Nouveau um, iron work. You know, I would have never known that I liked it had I not gone. But, you know, you can extrapolate this to a million other things because we are not siloed people. You know, my, my art reflects the things that I think about for national security. Sure. Um, and, and also I'm a woman and I, I want to talk about, you know, women's rights and women's suffrage. And all of these things, you know, it's a, uh, I want to be a full person. And in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, there is an article that says that um, a human right uh, is the, the right to the pursuit of one's full personality. Mm. And that to me is just so brilliant. And I mean, that, that we, would, we should pr try to pursue that. So that would be my, you know, advice, not just to, to high school students, but also to anyone, sure. you know, pursue yourself, learn about yourself. And um, we, it's not that you we're not finished products ever. You know, if you, if you know someone who's reached their full potential, like, let me know, cause I'd love to meet that person. <laughs> you know, we have not reached our full potential and, um, and hopefully we won't ever in our lifetime. So we can keep exploring and pursuing and it's at any age, it's at 50, it's at 60, it's at 70. And with the longevity science that is advancing right now, mm -hmm. we are going to be living longer and healthier. So it's not just our lifespan, it's our health span that's increasing. And when our health span increases, that means that you all of a sudden have the opportunity at 70 to say, you know what? I wanna learn to swing dance. I can do this. And among other things, right? Yep. But I think it boils down to giving yourself permission. Excellent message, excellent message. Uh, really fascinating stuff, Lydia, and, and wishing the best with all of this. Um, you have, a, you know, a, a wonderful portfolio. Um, the uh, for for everybody that's going to be watching this episode on the YouTube channel or listening uh, on the podcast, you've been spending time with Dr. Lydia Kostopoulos, Science and Emerging Technology Advisor at the United States Joint Special Operations University. Uh, check out her website, uh, lkcyber.com, where you can learn about her artwork, art about AI, uh, her uh, game, Sapien 2.0, also her fashion label, Empowering Workwear by Lydia. Um, Lydia, it's been a fascinating time listening to everything you have going on. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us uh, for a little while about it. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing to keep uh, our country safe. And as we say on the show, thank you for helping to, uh, to create a better tomorrow through all your initiatives. It's uh, really been a really fascinating time. Thank you so much. It's, it's been a pleasure. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the things that I'm so passionate about. So thank you. Absolutely.